Birmingham, Alabama, 1963. It was the most racist, most segregated city in the South. On April 12th, Birmingham, Alabama, 1963, Martin Luther King, it was the most racist. He had targeted Birmingham as the site for mass demonstrations against segregation, but the masses had failed to materialize, and King decided to go to jail himself. The nation watched quietly as King was placed in solitary confinement. 1963 would mark Dr. King's lowest point as leader of the civil rights movement. It had been eight long years since his only major victory with Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott. When I first met Dr. King, the mission he was embarking on was completely unknown to him. He had the foggiest idea where it would lead and certainly going to Birmingham was a choice of enormous consequence. It was a battlefield where the movement would sink or swim. Birmingham, to be perfectly honest, was a grim place through the eyes of African Americans. It was the most rigid, uh, the most violent, the most vicious. It was the biggest and baddest city in the South. We nicknamed it Birmingham. Frankly, compared to other places, there's no racial unrest in Birmingham. There'd been 60 unsolved bombings in Birmingham, and the local police had never arrested a soul. The Ku Klux Klan was big in Birmingham, all through the police department and up into City Hall. Life in Birmingham, as far as I'm concerned, is hell. I don't believe in the mixing of the races, and I don't care what anybody says. I might be prejudiced. I don't know. I probably am. But... As a kid, I always wanted to eat at Newberry's downtown, and I always wanted to be hamburger plate. Always. We couldn't have that. I went downtown to the Newberry's, and I was so happy because I could sit on the little black stools that twirled and order me a hot dog with everything on it. I'm not going to integrate. Instead of serving me, they called in the police. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. I never could understand why white people hated us. As a kid, I just felt like they thought some of the black would rub off on them, you know. Well, Birmingham is a symbol of hardcore resistance to integration. Wake under this philosophy. You can never whip these boys if you don't keep you and them separate. The good people of Birmingham had put Bull Connor in office seven times. Bull Connor. Mr. Bull Connor was the monster. His title was Commissioner of Public Safety, and his mission was to keep the streets safe for white people. He had a tank. 
Army tank? White. Under Bull Connor, Birmingham was the closest thing in America to a police state. So the theory was, we need to bring all this out in the open. And if they're going to kill us, let them kill us in the middle of the day, not at night one at a time. Most black people were afraid of the movement. My mom was scared. She would always say, don't make any waves. See, our parents, they couldn't go because they was working for the whites. If they were seen on the picket line, then they ended up losing their job or having their house foreclosed or having their car repossessed. So the parents couldn't do it. As a kid, we always wanted to think that these things would stop soon and that mom and dad, since they fixed everything else, that they would fix it. We thought that you could just uh, shame the white man into, look how bad you treat your Negroes, you know. But I found out that they were determined not to give one inch. Dr. King had gone to jail in hopes that thousands of protesters would follow his example and overwhelm the system. But it didn't work out that way. The blacks of Birmingham stayed home and the press quickly lost interest. Is he still in solitary confinement? Yes, he is. Uh -huh. I think he'll be there for a while. I don't know just when he'll be coming out. One of the last things King did before going to jail was to place an urgent call to a fiery young preacher in Mississippi by the name of James Bevel. Bevel was a secret weapon. He was the brain of the bunch. He was obnoxious as the devil, but that was his role. Well, I knew that the Birmingham project was going very slow because they couldn't get many people to go to jail. So what we got to do is go out and organize young people. The first thing I said, well, who did this doctor? They told me, Tall Paul was there and Shelly the Playboy, and they agreed with nonviolence. I was somewhat of a uh, crazy guy, I guess. What's up, brother? Shelly stood, he was the DJ for real back during the day. And he had a red car and had Shelly the Playboy written on Good goobly woobly. Shelly the Playboy was the mouth of the South. What's up, everybody? No one had a closer relationship with the kids in Birmingham. Make some noise, everybody! Make some noise! Woo! Being on the air, you had music, which was the bait. But each time you have an opportunity, you talk about freedom. You talk about rights. Didn't take very much to get the kids. The kids knew. They knew. We started with the football players and the cheerleaders and the beauty queen. I was an 88-pound majorette. I got involved in moving because I was talking to a little pretty girl. Ooh, I can see myself wearing long skirts, donut socks. Good morning, little school girl. Good morning, little school girl. We broke it down very simply. Look, you can get hit by a baseball bat playing baseball, but segregation destroys the inside of your mind and your soul, and it doesn't heal that easily. I played football on the football team. I played defensive tackle. Reverend Bevel asked, have you ever wondered why your helmets are always blue and white, but your school colors are green and gray? He said, you get the equipment that the white schools discard. I'm glad I chose the movement and not athletics. Bevel would turn down the lights and show a movie from the sit-in movement in Nashville. I saw a bunch of colored sitting on the stools. They looked like they were just trying to egg on a fight. The stark reality of nonviolence being met with violence was shocking and scary, and it drew kids in by the hundreds. Bevel would tell us, Miss Cotton would tell us, if you cannot restrain from being violent, Maybe the movement was not for you. Well, that was a beautiful concept after you think about it later. But when you get your head knocked on, you really got to think real hard and twice. 
because the fellas down on 15th Street, those fellas would fight back. They came to fight. But because of Dr. King and them girls, they would say, y'all, come on, cooperate. We need a peaceful protest. On Saturday, April 20th, Dr. King bonded out of jail. His release caused barely a ripple. We were defeated here in Birmingham. They had, they had beaten us down into the ground. Dr. King, in our strategy session, says that the only way to break Birmingham, we're going to have to fill the jails. So I say, I agree. I absolutely agree with you on that. Now, how I fill the jail is my business. <laughs> I remember that night, Dr. King speaking, he was trying like mad to get somebody to go to jail, and they just didn't stand. I remember King inviting any volunteers to go to jail the next day, and nobody stood up but us kids. That was it. Nobody volunteered but those kids. Dr. King said no. Playboy here on D-Day was the day, I tell you, this was the day where every student in Birmingham knew that it was going to happen. But you've got to remember that all of the planning was a secret. Good. Googly woogly. Good morning, children. The DJs were talking code and used songs from the hit parade as signals for action. I remember that morning I woke up with my mind on freedom. Oh, I took special pain with putting a little starch in my blouse. I got my toothbrush and uh, I got the toothpaste, the soap, because I had a feeling that I wouldn't be coming home. Ring, ring, go to bed. This doctor pushed D-Day early in the morning, but they wouldn't even use D-Day. They was they use all that jive talk. <laughs> Don't forget, kids. There's gonna be a party in the park, and don't forget your toothbrushes, cause luncheon will be served. Back in the classroom, open your book. Now everybody who's listening know what the deal is. D-Day was the day. My mother said, okay, Gwen, don't go to that march. I mean, don't go. You go to school. I told my mother, I said, I hear you. We were raised not to lie. Mm -mm. So I didn't tell her lies that I wasn't going. I said, I hear you. We would have people picked out. Your job is to turn this fire alarm, turn that fire alarm, get the football team, basketball team, get the cheerleaders, get the band. It was right at 11 o'clock when they arrived. They came up to the fence with a sign that just said, it's time. When we said, let's go, go for the window. And I told the others, come on, let's go. And I looked around, and you know, all I could see was my own fanny, almost, you know. <laughs> I hollered back up at those kids, but you said you were going to go. You know, you, you promised. And that's when kids started coming. They were coming out of windows, coming out of doors. It's so beautiful. You wouldn't believe it. Mrs. Story turned her back as we got up. And we took it from there. I wanted to walk out with them, but it was my job. There was nothing you could do once the students started moving. The principal, the teachers, and everybody had to step aside. My boyfriend tried to stop me from going, and I walked around the building, and I came right back out there and went out the gate. You have about two children left in the class, maybe. Everybody's gone. I'm sure that morning, Bevel was nervous about who was going to show up. At first, there were a few. Then there were hundreds. Then there were thousands. We heard that kids were coming in from all over the city. And when we heard that they were coming in from out of town, we got more excited. And I had a cool car, you know. 
they said, okay, we need you to go out to Fairfield. There's some students outside the classroom that won't go back in. Lo and behold, when I got out to Fairfield, the whole campus was outside of the building, and they all said, we going to Birmingham. 20 kids climbed on the car, and 800 followed behind him. I love the way you walk. The more we walked, the more we gathered. And every every once in a while, you look back and you saw it was more kids coming from somewhere, from another direction. You said, where are all these kids coming from? You had never seen that many people in your life. It's like a football game. Kids walked as far as 18 miles to get to Birmingham in order to be arrested. And the purpose was to go to jail. The gathering place was 16th Street Baptist Church. Oh, uh, we poured into 16th Street like a waterfall. They were coming in all doors, from all directions, from the basement, from the back. It was just like one big pep rally. Here's Park, are you in the house? Or Western, are you in the house? And who's out here from Western High School? <laughs> Children were ready. They were ready to hit the streets. Kelly Ingram Park was the big green buffer between Black Birmingham and the white downtown. 16th Street Baptist Church was on one corner, and by noon, Birmingham's finest were on the other. It was all laid out like a battlefield. To think about it now, I get the shakes. What could have happened? Martin Luther King spent the day at his motel, wrestling with his conscience. A lot of people thought the kids were going to get hurt. But the reality of it was that we were born black in Alabama, and we were going to get hurt if we didn't do something. When noon came and went without a public appearance by King, Bevel opened the floodgates. They came out in waves of 50. The first 50 came out, he peacefully arrested them. And, well, that does it. And the next 50 shows up, and the next 50, <laughs> and he go get some old paddy wagons. They would cram the paddy wagons full of people, and then they would jam the doors shut. Within an hour, the police had abandoned wagons and started to bring in school buses. Fill up a bus, pull up another bus, fill it up. We arrested those kids in wholesale numbers. Bevel timed it so that each group of 50 seemed like the last. And what they didn't know was as the kids were going out of the front door, more kids were coming in the back door. 50, 50. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, when they gonna stop? <laughs> I think when the police arrested us, they thought that we would be afraid and start to cry. They had strange looks to see that we were happy and singing and glad to be arrested. It's after about 12 o'clock. So maybe they got five, six hundred students in jail now. I told Bull Connor, we have to take a break. And he walked out in the middle of the streets where the police was. Don't you think we ought to take a break? You need to let your men cool out. We'll cool out. Take a lunch break. And he said, yeah, well, we need a break because my officers have been out here and haven't had anything to eat. And the side, he says, here come the lunch truck. The next thing I knew, they passing out Coca-Colas to him. <laughs> Bull kind of saw me eating that salmon. He said, hey, what that nigga do? <laughs> you know I mean? 
soon as the rest period ended, uh, he come back over where we were. They go back over where they were, and they start back to kick it back. I'm in with the in crowd. By 3 o'clock, almost a 1,000 black kids were under arrest for parading without a permit. There were so many kids in jail, the schools couldn't teach. I remember that so well because my classroom was in jail. <laughs> the whole class. We were told to say we were 15, and that would keep us out of the big jail. Didn't work in my case. I can remember some of them thinking that we're going to kill them. They'd tell me, oh, I know you're going to kill me, but I want to call my mama first. <laughs> When the children were in jail, the people were pulling them. Dr. King, my daughter in jail. Dr. King, my son in jail. Dr. King, what are we going to do? I mean, parents just all around here talking about their children in jail. Just as calm, just as nice. Don't worry about your children. They are going to be all right. Don't hold them back if they want to go to jail. For they are doing a job for all of America and for all mankind. My father told me I could not be part of that movement. I had better not go back downtown. He didn't tell me I couldn't go back to church, which is where it all started in the first place, right? Well, in that church, I'd have two Birmingham detectives. Well, we had a microphone. We didn't tell him that. You've got to know what the other guy's doing if you're going to whip him. Listen up, brothers and sisters. If today was D-Day, tomorrow will be double D-Day. By day two, the word was out, and more than 3,000 spectators converged on the church to watch. But no one could have imagined what they were about to see. And we got to the park, police were lined up. They were marching, got ready. I ready. Oh, good Lord, I scared to death. And then the officers gave the order to open up. They aim for your head to knock you down. And that water had pressure behind it. It hurt. During the meeting the day before, they had told us the policeman might hit you, the policeman might have dogs, uh, they might spit on you, they might kick you. But I remember thinking that no one said anything about water hoses. You can see that the first blast of water dispersed the crowds. But when the water subsided, there were 10 kids still standing. And they were singing one word over and over. surged back behind them. The firemen were certainly faced with 200, then 500 protesters. Bull Connor standing there with his hands on his hips. Shoot the water on those niggers. The water was so powerful, the four men couldn't hold it steady. We could hear the firemen yelling, knock the niggers down. The hose rolled me right down the street, like a sheet of paper. And look, it was sting so bad. Suddenly you could see against the sky these bricks and stones. They were calling us SOBs and bastards, and it started with the rocks and the bottles. They were arresting them as fast as they could. Bull came through with that damn tank. And black folk were throwing and hitting that tank with balls and rocks.
Bull O'Connor would tell them. Bring the dogs out. Most of the dogs were on a leash, but if you reach out, the dog's gonna bite you. There was this vicious, vicious big old dog that turned loose on this smaller child, and the dog lunged at his throat, and it hit him and bit him. Police had named this black dog nigga. It was a black German Shepherd. They had nigga trained. The nigga would bite you. A nigga would bite anybody, black or white. It make no difference. <laughs> Firemen, journalists, and teenagers all went to the hospital. I saw a fireman get smashed in the face. He was hurt, and of course, Bull Connor just shipped him out. Our police and sheriff's officers have met the first test with flying colors. They deserve great praise as they maintain the peace When President Kennedy saw his Saturday papers, he said the photos made him sick. The embarrassment for us around the world. That's when Kennedy called Birmingham. Kennedy had sent word down that if children got involved, that his administration couldn't put that kind of stuff. President stop the movement. I don't think so. <laughs> well, the Kennedys knew nothing about the South. Why would they? They rich, uh, Ivy League. Kennedy thought we were crazy. He was talking with Dr. King and them about getting these kids out the movement, but it was out of Dr. King's hands. Kids were all over the place. You going to jail today? Jimmy is going. I went yesterday. Why can't I go? I'm going to jail. He's going to jail. We're going to have a party in jail. People are interested in our struggle all over the country. Uh, Mr. Dick Gregory will be in Sunday. Dick Gregory came out to march with the kids, and he was the most famous person we had ever seen. I got there 20 minutes before I got arrested. They was already moved out. They rushed me out to the front of the line. All of the policemen started running after them on the motorcycle. Run, 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 run. I had to run, catch up with them. And a block later, we was all arrested. Some children got out of jail, and they were so excited about it, they turned around and go right back. My mother said, boy, you in jail again? <laughs> she said, boy, you better stay out of that jail. Those people are going to hurt you. I said, no, they're not. Because we got God on our side. And once they were in jail, it was kind of depressing. It had rats, and it was nasty and filthy. They fed us bologna sandwiches with nothing on it, just dry bread. One sandwich now. Bull Connor demanded that every child be interrogated. They were asking me a lot of questions about why did you march? Who told you to march? Did they force you to march? After you sit and ask the same 10 questions of hundreds of kids, you're beginning to say, what am I doing here? What, what is the end of this madness? We was in there about two weeks, about two weeks. And we were singing. Oh my God, we'd be singing. When they put us in jail, the guys were in one side and the girls were on the other side, and if you could hear them. And they would sing songs. Then the girls would sing a song to answer them back. I'm in jail at night, and everybody's singing and laughing and, and enjoying themselves. And I see this little four-year-old boy, two o'clock morning. I 
I said, hey, what's your name? How old are you? He said, four. I said, what are you here for? He said, Tedum. He couldn't even say freedom, man. The demonstrations continued every day, and every day the movement struggled to head off violence from whites and blacks. I call on all the citizens of Birmingham, both Negro and white, to realize that violence only breeds more violence. See, once you arrest 3,000 people, you have no control. Especially when they ain't scared of you. Hmm? Fucking in at them one. By Saturday, some kids were coming downtown in their bathing suits. It was fun. Hey, baby, pass the soap. It was hot, that soap. You know what I'm saying? And just to get sprinkled down with the holes was beautiful. <laughs> Children will be out there shaking. I hear behind a girl. <laughs> so I went up to the water, put the water on me. You bad? And this young guy was standing in there. They were calling them names, talk about their mama and all kinds of stuff. It was funny, but it was stupid. The children were saying, I want to go to jail. I want to go to jail. She got rollers, hair curlers, everything you can think of in hair her handbag. Curlers. Why does she have those? For jail. You got to look good in jail. I want equal rights. I want equal rights. Just like everybody else. Just like everybody else. I want my freedom just like everybody else. There were 800 kids in the hog pens at the fairgrounds. A crowd of parents gathered at the fence, tossing food, sweaters, blankets. When it started to rain, the cops walked to their cars and sat inside, dry. I was wet, and I was cold, and I wanted my mama, and I wanted my daddy, and I was scared. I want my mama, I want to go home. They treated us like they did the livestock. And you know, it really smelled like that, too. <laughs> and then you're wet. Children were used to run. Sometimes in the middle of the night. I got out on Sunday, and I wasn't ready to go because the there were a lot of people still in jail. My mom, when I got home, the first thing she did, naturally, she smelled me coming. <laughs> so she said, oh, girl, you can't go in that house. I need to wash you down. Need to, uh, let's take the holes in. I said, not any more water. When she came home, I remember my mama hugging her and I said, bless your heart, baby. Bless your heart. All those men have been arrested. We have already won a victory here in Birmingham. Because yesterday we filled up the jail. And today we filled up the jail yard. And on the Myra, I don't know what they're going to do. By Tuesday, May 7th, the city of Birmingham faced a state of collapse. 3,000 students were stampeding through downtown in a victory lap. The police had been made helpless. Kids was everywhere, you know what I mean? All down through town. We couldn't stop it. We couldn't contain it. The white people were in panic. <laughs> they didn't know what to do. They'd, they'd turn you loose. By the seventh day of demonstrations, it became obvious there was no end of children in sight. I sat there in the jail and I said, uh, no way to hold me up. 
the fear is gone. There were 72 hours of intense negotiations. Movement leaders and white officials were up until dawn with an open line to the White House. I'm very happy to be able to announce that we have come today to the climax of the long struggle for justice, freedom, and human dignity in the city of Birmingham. After more than 5,000 arrests, the white people of Birmingham had finally agreed to integrate, and the state courts removed Bull Connor after seven terms in office. Well, folks, it's official. Mr. Bull Connor is out of a job. Bull Connor was beat by the young people of the city of Birmingham. But what really surprised us was when Kennedy came on television and addressed the nation and said, this is the end of segregation. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is, whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities, whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. I remember watching the president on TV, and I knew he was talking about me. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed? And stand in place. Once he made that statement, it's like, stop, stop, stop. Oh, this guy gonna preach. And he went on and on and on. Now the time has come for this nation to fulfill its promise. The Children's March broke the back of Birmingham. Birmingham led to the March of Washington. Birmingham changed the South in an incredible way. There would be retaliations, riots, and a fatal bombing in the church where it all began. But in the year of 1963, in the month of May, Today, in the city of Birmingham, Birmingham, because of what has happened, we can say from the depths of our hearts, as never before, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, It's really funny to think about it, that the police, the fire department, and the KKK were beaten by us kids. You know why? Because they were not looking for us. They were never looking for the children. The secret weapon. I felt like I was a giant at 15. Yes! The unsung heroes, the children. <laughs> 